We're going to start talking about Unit 5 in Women's Health, Childbirth, Labor, and Delivery, and then the Complications of Labor and Delivery. This is going to be covering Chapters 15, 16, 17, and 18 of your um, Women's Health book. Things to think about. Um, when you're thinking about the woman that is ready to give labor, you need to be thinking about uh, the station, where the baby is at related to mom's ischial uh, spines, how the baby is coming down in the pelvic pelvic inlet. So by looking at this pictorial view, it talks about uh, the journey to delivery, which is kind of a nice little analysis. And this picture is uploaded to you uh, on your doc sharing page. So if you want to print this out and look at it a little more closely, you certainly can. The thing to remember when we are talking about um, station, station mean, meaning how far up or down in mom's pelvis is that baby. So when we're looking at the negative numbers right here at the top by the F, um, that's going to mean that the baby is very high, so floating high, um, up high in the pelvis. Uh, when you, the care provider is doing a cervical vaginal exam, oftentimes they're not able to feel the baby because the baby is so high up in the pelvis. As these numbers become more positive, so zero station um, is when we see that the baby is halfway there. Doing vaginal exams is going to be very easy, um, probably just by inserting your fingers, um, maybe a inch or two, you will be able to feel the head. Um, and then as it becomes plus one, plus two, plus three, um, and then plus four would be delivery. So when you're looking at these plus two, three, and fours, that's where you're going to be seeing the baby's head. You'll be seeing some part of the fetus. So that is going to be really important uh, for you to know those numbers. When we're looking at nursing assessments to help promote well-being of mother and the baby during normal um, labor and delivery, the, th the three things that you must do when that mom arrives to labor and delivery is get her hooked up to that monitor because we need to be able to determine what fetal condition is. We need to know if we have accelerations. We need to know if we have decelerations. Um, so we need to have a nice picture of what that fetus looks like in utero. Think thinking about mom's condition. A full set of vitals is going to be very important. Asking her about her pain. We need to know when contractions started. How long they're lasting. Is she ruptured? Is her bag of water intact? It'll be important to, you know, talk to her about questions. And then when you talk about nearness to birth, that's when you are going to be looking at um, your sterile vaginal exam. And the sterile vaginal exams, really a lot of that depends on per institution, whether physicians want you to do that independently or if you have to wait to get a physician's order. But those are that the nearness to birth is going to be how far dilated, so how, o how open is her cervix. How effaced is she? How thin is that cervix? And then the fetal station. So is she at a minus three, very high in posterior? Or is she at a plus two, where you go in and check her and you're able to see the head of the fetus? Fetal assessment, um, there's a couple of different ways that we can determine fetal heart rate. We can do it with a Doppler, which is most oftentimes used in the clinic um, and as, as well in OB if we're looking to um, establish where to put uh, the monitors. So you'll be seeing the Doppler in the clinic and as well as in the hospital or a fetoscope or um, just with the electronic fetal monitoring. So we talked about A1 in the very first unit and the importance of A1 because A1 sets our standards. So normal fetal heart rate is 110 to 160 and fetal heart rate will either be assessed continuously or assessed according to how high risk, high low risk is our mom. So in that early latent phase, every hour is going to be good. Um, you can dop tone, hook her up to the monitor, um, when she's in active phase, every 30 minutes, and then that second stage, um, every 15 minutes is going to be important. And then while she's pushing, um, you'll probably document even more frequently on those uh, fetal vitals. Fetoscope and Doppler scope, so you can just see a couple of different pictures. Uh, with the fetoscope, obviously mom and significant other are going to be able to hear that baby's heartbeat, and that is you know, really extremely reassuring for our um, patient. Um, with the fetoscope, 
Occasionally you'll see those in OB. I wouldn't say that they'll be very common by any means, but they're definitely out there and still of use in some practices. Works much like a stethoscope, as you can tell. Um, the band right here that sits on top of her head um, just makes it easier for stability. When we're looking at the external fetal monitor, um, this is your monitor back here. The great thing about the external fetal monitor is we can identify changes in those fetal heart rate during contractions. We can do non-stress tests if she's um, a high-risk pregnancy. Um, when we're doing that, uh, the Doppler is placed over the back of the fetus and then it will trace the fetal heart rate on the top part of the fetal heart paper, or the monitor paper. And then the bottom part of that paper is where we're going to be seeing our contraction patterns. So that transducer is going to be placed over the fundus of the uterus. And when we are looking at external fetal monitors, the thing to remember with an external fetal monitor is that it's going to just really tell us about timing of contractions. It doesn't give us a true sense of the intensity. We have to have an internal monitor for that, which is on the next slide and we'll talk about. Um, but external fetal monitors are going to be very reliable in OB to talk about fetal heart rate, fetal heart condition in comparison to contractions, and then our timing of contractions, so how often they are and how long they're lasting. So with the internal fetal monitor, things you need to remember about that, and this is um, on figure 17-3 in your text, the internal fetal monitor, mom has to meet a couple of requirements in order to have it. So first of all, she has to have a ruptured bag of water because this monitor, as you can see over here in this pictorial view, um, it's going to go up inside of the uterus and then it rests alongside of the baby. Um, so she has to have a ruptured bag of waters and then she needs to be at least one to two centimeters dilated because the physician has to get their hands, um, has to do a vaginal exam and then kind of open that cervix up and then slide the internal monitor um, up alongside of the baby's head. Internal monitors can only be um, placed by physicians. Nurses can do scalp electrodes, but the physicians have to do the internal um, IUPC. So um, the also the other um, thing that we need to look at is then that internal electrode, which is a spiral electrode that is applied to the fetal scalp, and that gives us a much clearer or a much better um, determination of how the baby is doing or how the fetus is doing in utero. And nurses can place those um, internal electrodes, and we will um, bring some examples of the internal um, IUPC as well as the spiral electrode into the classroom so you are able to get some hands on and take a look at those. So the uterine catheter, um, when we're looking at that, that's referred to as an IUPC, intrauterine uh, pressure catheter, and it's very pressure sensitive. So it's placed up alongside of the baby in, um, inside of the uterus, and then what that's going to detect is the amount of pressure that those contractions are having uh, inside of the uterus. So when we want to know true intensity of contractions, we have to have an internal fetal monitoring. So assessing fetal heart rate, uh, this slide depicts uh, some certain times that we absolutely should be assessing fetal heart rate. So right after rupture of membranes, and I'm not saying, you know, if you have a woman coming in from home that um, she needs to be alarmed, but she definitely, you know, we educate them to come in and uh, to be assessed uh, once they've ruptured at home. So we do want to assess heart rate immediately after rupture, before and after activity, so be ambulation to the bathroom, up and take a shower, bath, anything like that. Obviously before and after medication, especially when we're talking about the administration of anesthesia. The anesthesia does cross the placental barrier and so you will see a decrease in fetal heart rate variability. So it is important to document where your fetal heart rate was before administration of analgesics and then where you're sitting um, once anesthesia um, has started to take effects of mom. We should be looking um, after vaginal exams or if we have excessive tachycystole uterine contractions. Other things with preterm infants, maternal fever, you will see a rise in fetal heart rate when mom has um, fever. So looking at that in fetal infections, maternal stimulant drug use. So if you're looking at cocaine, methamphetamine, um, some of those stimulants, a lot of caffeine, which is really not uncommon to see um, those increased fetal heart rates. And then looking at those decelerations, um, if they are persistent after the end of the contraction. And remember, those are going to be called late decelerations because they nadir 
or peak after uh, the peak of the contraction. So those are going to be things that we need to continue to assess and reassess when we're looking at babes. Uh, for maternal, uh, maternal condition, we can monitor contractions either by palpation, so with our hands, or continuous external fetal monitor. We can uh, monitor as she progresses through labor, either by vaginal exams or um, her behavior. A lot of the vaginal exams um, are going to be done by you, the nurse, but it's going to be very much physician preference. So as you get out in the field and as you become practicing nurses, you do kind of have to, you know, you need to gauge what your physicians are wanting from you and what their expectations are. I know we would like to see her void every couple of hours. Um, it is really important to have her urinate prior to administration of the intrathecal or epidural uh, pain management. So we do want her voiding as much as possible. And then her response to labor. So how has her breathing changed? What is she doing to alleviate some of that pain? Or how is she trying to relax? So are we doing um, slow, deep breathing? Is she using distraction? Um, or is she comfortable? And then looking for verbal and nonverbal cues. And we just recall that information from when we've discussed pain and um, assessing pain. So is she crying? Is she fearful? Um, looking at those things. We, as far as her vital signs go, if she has a temperature greater than 100.4, oftentimes in a pregnant woman that is associated with affection, infection, so we're going to need to um, be calling our physician and letting them know, especially if you have a woman that is more than 24 hours ruptured, really important to be talking to your physician about that. If she does have an elevated temperature, um, we are going to be rechecking that every one to two hours, as you can see on the bottom of this slide. Blood pressure, um, if she has an elevated blood pressure, we're going to be checking that every hour. Same thing with her um, temperature. We want to be making sure that those things aren't increasing and that we could have the possibility of um, her becoming eclamptic and having a seizure as that blood pressure continues to rise. So we definitely want to make sure that when we have abnormal findings in our OB patients that we are taking the time to recheck those, call our physicians, and keep our physicians informed. So that all goes back to that collaboration, collaborative care, communication, um, and making sure that everybody is informed of your patient's progress. So so when we're talking about assessing uh, nearness to birth, things to be aware of, um, observing for signs of impending birth. So is she kind of going back and forth between one butt cheek and the other? Is she really uncomfortable? Does she feel like there's something big and bulging in her pelvis? Um, does she feel like she has to have a bowel movement? Um, are you noticing that maybe there's some increased bleeding? Um, what are her contraction patterns? Looking at those types of things. It's also important um, to check her to do a vaginal exam, check to ensure that she is completely dilated, that her cervix is a 10, um, and that can be done by you or your physician. Like I said, that's all going to go back to uh, physician preference. Assessing contractions. Um, when you are assessing contractions and you are comparing contractions to external fetal monitoring or internal fetal monitoring, it doesn't matter. You might see that the baby is starting to have um, multiple variables. So you might see with some head compression as that head comes down into um, the pelvis and vagina that you will see decelerations so that baby's heart rate is going to mirror the um, contraction pattern. And so a lot of times we see that as the she becomes um, closer and closer to delivery. And then with contractions, they do slow down a little bit. Um, she kind of has a little bit of break before the pushing starts. So watching that external fetal monitoring and being aware of those subtle changes and subtle cues. Um, I'm going to stop with this one and we will continue on talking about amniotic fluid on the next um, presentation.